Welcome everybody to our uh, HMGS No Dice, No Glory Roundtable. Today we have, uh, I'm Mitch, I'm your moderator. Uh, today we have a special guest, uh, Phil Bolger, who's a coworker of mine. And I, from working with him for the last few months, is probably one of the best DOD professional war game designers I've got the pleasure to work with. Uh, you see here, he's in the foxes. I'm a wolf, but we're at we're a happy uh, menagerie uh, together, our two organizations. So, Phil, without any further ado, the floor is yours, sir. Appreciate it, Mitch. So, thank you, everybody, for having me here. I'm going to talk through, for about the next 30 to 45 minutes, just some principles of defense-oriented game design. So, defense-oriented game design is a little bit different than commercial game design in terms of what we pay attention to, why we make a game, and what we hope to get out of it. Over the next half hour or so, I'll be glad to show you guys that, and then I'll take questions for what I can answer. Um, boilerplate disclaimer, everything I'm showing you here is unclassified. None of it is proprietary information from my firm or from AFWIC. This is all open stuff, but depending on what you ask, if I tell you I can't answer it, I'm not being a jerk. I'm just sticking to my NDA. So with that uh, pleasant, pleasantness out of the way, let's go on through. So what is a game? I have here listed a wide variety of games, video games, board games, miniatures games, other tabletop games, role-playing games that I've played throughout my lifetime. Uh, there's about 40 odd titles on here. And not all of these are going to be useful for us in defense, but all of these are categorized as a game. So in my opinion, to tell you what kind of game you want for defense, you first have to look at what is a game in general. So commercial games are usually designed to entertain. They're designed to have a bunch of people sit around, uh, whether you're sitting on computers or a board or across a, across a table with painted minis and have a good time together. That's not really what we're doing. So let's talk about why these games aren't relevant to us. So the first thing's not relevant is multiplayer games. So I faded some of those. Multiplayer heavy games are focused on competition. They're not really about the mechanics representing any kind of realism. They're about the mechanics being competitive. This is why a lot of games refer to issues with balance or issues with, you know, that's OP, that's unfair, etc. For folks like that making a lot of multiplayer intensive games, they have to worry about balance. For defense, we don't worry about balance unless our intelligence sources say we should. Essentially, the real world is not balanced. If the United States tomorrow decided to go to war against Honduras, there would be very little Honduras could do about it other than go, well, I guess this is us now. We could talk more about insurgency if you want to be difficult, but the point is balance for peer-to-peer -peer is not something we really look at. Some things are just fantastic in nature. They tend to be focused on telling a fantastic story. A lot of games on that, the real emphasis is less on the individual mechanics of struggle and more on the grand picture of what do you go through to get to where you are. We can take mechanics from those, but overall, we don't tell stories. We let our players tell stories sometimes because the narratives they get out may inform their defense goals, but they're not quite right. The seminar game I, fig I figured out, the National Security Decision Making game, is one of the best games that I've ever played. However, for the purposes of what I do, it's too broad. NSDM is very focused on pole mill and a lot of other circumstances that most defense clients view as above their station. The average 04 or 05 in the Army or the Air Force doesn't deal a lot with politicians or diplomats. They simply get orders that come from them and execute as they're expected. Role-playing games are also not something we can use. For the most part, role-playing games, just like their more fantastic story-oriented brethren, are more focused about the communal storytelling experience than they are any individual mechanic. Now again, this is not universally true. There's exceptions all over the board, but in general, role-playing games are just a very different thing than what we're trying to do. So some things are too abstract. You saw I just faded Desert Strike and Twilight Struggle. Though Desert Strike and Twilight Struggle both deal with realistic material, Twilight Struggle, a simulation of the Cold War, and Desert Strike, a arcade game that became popular after the 1991 Gulf War featuring an Apache helicopter. 
they show something real, but they do it to a degree. In the case of Twilight Struggle, you're seeing it from way too high up. I can't pitch that back to my clients and inform them this is what they're supposed to do. By contrast, Desert Strike is way too far below. You really only track one helicopter, and it's a super helicopter with, an, with just insane complement of weapons, and it's the world's only Apache that can somehow carry passengers, and it's a fun little arcade game, but it's too small scope and nowhere near realistic. So then we fade out remaining fantasy games. Maybe they get the scope right. Maybe they look at sort of the right degree of what you have, the right complexity, but they're fundamentally not of this world. So for us, we also cross those out. And then history's over, guys. We might like playing history recreationally, but there is a world of difference between war and World War II and war today. So what I have left on here is a selection of near modern games. And uh, not to be too difficult, these don't work either. For various reasons, all of these aren't quite right. Some of that is what we do involves the very cut and edge of modernity, whereas you may have noticed Central America is a game from the 80s. Thunderbolt Apache Leader, the first edition came out in the early 90s and the reprint came out in 2012. And uh, America Breach likewise was a uh, late 2000s game. So, what does that leave us? Well, I'd like to go back to what I said in common. What do all these games have in common? And I will defer to a much wiser game designer than myself. So, Sid Meier's quote, a game is a series of meaningful choices, sometimes mangled as a game is a series of interesting choices, distills what fundamentally all of these have in common. Whether you're playing a multiplayer shooter game, whether you're playing a strategy game, whether you're playing a game that's fantasy in the real world, modern, historical, it is fundamentally a series of meaningful choices. So when we look at what do we offer defense clients, it's a series of meaningful choices. Now you might say, Phil, you just put 40 odd games up and told me all of them were useless. No, no, no. I explain why we don't use them. But the catch is there are parts of every single game I chose that are useful. And one of the principles of good defense-oriented game design is being able to understand mechanics and where they come from. So I'd like to give you guys some examples. Useful mechanics in unusual places. I got three video game photos here. One from Overwatch, one from Super Mario World, and one from Madden, I believe, 17. Each of these have a mechanic that could be used in defense. For Overwatch, I have highlighted the play of the game. Overwatch is a competitive first-person shooter game, and at the end of every match, there is a 24-second snapshot of what the game's algorithm adjudicates as the most useful 24 seconds of the match. Now, this gets made fun of by people that play the game a lot because it's not always accurate, and it's biased towards a, a few individual characters, but that mechanic is useful. Why is that useful to, for defense? If you've ever dealt with general officers, they don't have a lot of time on their hands. If you can condense the findings of a war game to 24 seconds, ideally with visuals, you will make their day. You will give them something to repeat. You will give them something to pick at if they are interested and go further, but you will not waste their time. You will not give them a 50-page post-game report that they will never read. Mitch is well aware of the struggles with this. Geos like short. So a way to get that is just perfect. For Mario... You have Mario demonstrating canalizing terrain here. He's got the lava on either side of him, and if he touches it, you lose a life. You run up, I mean, this particular player has quite a few lives, so I don't think he would worry, but it's the same thing. This is an incentive that teaches people don't touch that terrain. You want that incentive in war games as well, which is why you have difficult, penal or difficult terrain penalties or outright hostile terrain doing damage to units that move through. We have to explain this in our day job as well. There's some areas for whatever reason, whether it's politics, whether it's a highly contested environment, whether it's just plain bad weather that you don't want to move through right now. And last but not least, we got Von Miller, excellent linebacker from the Denver Broncos, Texas A&M grad. Uh, we've got him turned into a series of numbers. The thing about gaming is that anything can be turned into a series of numbers. So long as you have the right quantifications and so long as you make the right justifications. I don't know what goes into the secret sauce at Madden. There's a lot of discussions about that, but they have metrics that they use to determine whether or not he's going to be fast enough, strong enough, agile enough. All of those go into that, and they look at how this player performs in real life and translate that to a game. Now, the big caveat I have with that is anytime you translate real-world stuff into game stuff, you're going to lose something. But 
Fundamentally, games are models. And in the words of mathematician George Box, who was a big time model and statistic guys in the 70s, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. For defense wargaming, we're trying to make useful models. We know we cannot make a one-to-one -one representation of the real world. War is immeasurably complex, as anybody that's read Clausewitz can tell you. However, we want to get them something useful. So I've talked a little bit about this. I'm not going to do slideshow karaoke for, the, for, the, uh, for you guys. I'm not going to beat it to death, but I do want to just go over real quick the big left versus right over there. So recreational games are fun. Analytical games are really about trying to learn stuff. Recreational games, you want to win. You want to hit your objectives. Analytical games are more about the how. We want to hear how our players are accomplishing objectives. What kind of planning is going to go into it? What kind of logistics are they going to need? How are they going to get from here to there? In real life, it is much more complex than simply moving an icon around on a screen or on a board. We want to bring that out. Commercial games, there's a big, big emphasis on displayed representation. I'm pretty sure everybody in the audience has been turned off by ugly visuals, poor production quality minis, or bad graphics in a video game. Uh, in our side, we don't worry about that. That's not what we're paid for. So they care more about are the mechanics represented correctly. Fixed adjudication, most war games are fixed adjudication. If I sit down across from any of you guys to play Twilight Struggle, we may argue over what the rules say, but functionally, we're not going to bend or break the rules. For a defense-oriented war game, you do. A big part of defense-oriented war game is variable adjudication, being able to lean on subject matter experts that are in the adjudication cell or that you can summon on request to help inform whether or not you're adjudicating things correctly. When you're dealing with something as complex as modern war with as many different levers as it has, you will inevitably overlook something. This is a way to protect against that. And lastly, environment. I got the photo there over on the right of cadets at West Point playing the World War I game, Fields of Despair. They're in a learning environment. Their field grade that's teaching the class is going to pause it to ask them, why are they making these decisions? What did they learn? That's a little bit different from me on the weekends where I might have a beer in my hand while I game. So what can a game tell us? A game can tell us why commanders make decisions. They can tell you about resource allocation, TTPs, how to react against potential enemy TTPs, strengths and weaknesses of groups of systems, and what sort of decisions become available. The big thing that really wraps up all of this is that games can tell you human-oriented things that models struggle with. On the defense side, gaming is often accompanied with models, but they're not quite the same. They complement each other, but they both have a distinct purpose. The reason why you might want to game over a model is that they're tools, but they are complicated tools. They are things that take many different inputs that more or less move in a straight line or a flow chart or a series of straight lines and map them out. Complex, on the other hand, interplays in a much different way. And once you start with human input, as of right now, they're better adjudicated through war games. Uh, depending on advances in AI, Mitch and I may both be out of a job next decade, but at least for right now, this cannot be done by a model, at least not well. So I've talked for a lot about what we do or why we might do there. Let's go through the process of assuming you want a custom war game. So all of our custom war games start with a research question or a pair of research questions or 50 pages of research questions, God help us all. And once we get that and realize we need to make a game, we look at one of three options. The first one is modify an established game. With this, we mean a game that we have de developed in-house, not necessarily a commercial game. Although depending on what's been asked, we can modify commercial games in order to, to make them playable for our clients. You can create a new game on an established engine or build a new engine for a new game. The third one is the hardest. And of course, it's the one we get asked to do the most. Also important to talk about time. So we deliver on a very tight schedule. One of the nice things about working for defense clients is again, they don't expect a lot of polish. They don't expect great graphics, but the downside of that is they will come to you and say, we want a war game by the end of this year, by the end of this month, at least on one nerve wracking hair tearing occasion in the next two weeks. And you get used to that. So the three big levers you're looking at are availability, fidelity, and resilience of any war game. Uh, availability is 
how much can we get people to it? How much can we get it to people? How easy is it to get everybody in the same room? Fidelity is how well does it represent real life? Very high fidelity game is going to be pretty cumbersome. And then the resilience is how much can we make it so that nobody could break it? I'm pretty sure everybody in the audience has had experience playing broken games. This is a very real challenge, although thankfully our players don't tend to be very min-maxy, so that's nice. And quick war games frequently run at low fidelity. Um, don't fear low fidelity. A lot of people do. A lot of people in defense, especially when they hear low fidelity, they get nervous because they assume that means you're going to get bad data. I'd like to refer back to what George Box said that I quoted earlier, with all models are wrong, but some models are useful. The third bullet point I have there is that sometimes they just need a 70% solution. A lot of defense planners are struggling because they are at a zero or 25% and they can't get to 70, let alone 100. So starting off with something low fidelity that gets them there is definitely helpful to them. They understand they're not going to walk away with it with all their answers, but they may walk away with a more refined research question. The other big thing is that they're quick. Low fidelity games are quick to make and quick to run. For defense professionals, getting more than about three hours of time is a challenge. If you want a very long game, such as Title X war games, which last weeks, you have to schedule them months or sometimes even years in advance. So there's a, good, there's a lot of ability for something that you can play very quickly. And lastly, you guys can read the findings I've got there. Low fidelity is not great for specifics, but for generals and trends, just fine. And then I have lists or shown there, Mark Herman's Fort Sumter. So if you haven't played Fort Sumter, it's a simple card-driven card game about the political and to an extent military situation in America uh, leading into the secession and the Civil War. It's not a great one-to-one -one representation of the politics, but it plays in 30 minutes and gets the point across of what was important in the North and what was important to the South and what they spent their resources on and why they made the decisions they made. So it's a great example of a game that if you're looking to teach somebody about the Civil War through a game, this is much more approachable and much more easy to start with than, say, for the people. Also excellent, but much steeper learning curve. Takes much more time. So where do we start with our custom war games? So the biggest thing is I talked about that research question. You have to have a good grasp on the scenario under exploration. What this means for me and my team is that we spend a lot of time researching. Uh, if you're interested in this on the commercial side, I will tell you that a subscription to Jane's is well worth your time. You will make your money back several times over just by being able to repeat things in it. But for us, we also have to do research with the specific people. If we are asked to do work with say Air Force Special Operations, it means everybody on my team that's going to be involved in designing that game needs to talk with Air Force Special Operators. They need to research and understand what are they, where are they based, what systems do they use, what vulnerabilities do they have, where are they going in the future, where do they want to go in the future, how could they be hurt by the enemy, how can they hurt the enemy, where are they most useful in the Air Force picture, in the joint picture, in the national picture. This is a lot of stuff, but you have to be familiar with it. The less familiar you are, the harder it will be to design a meaningful game, and the more likely you will spend a lot of time designing something that the client cannot use. Then I have it as a third. For adjudicators, you need to be a systems library. You want to know modern military systems forward and back. The scariest words an adjudicator can say when somebody mentions, how do I use system X, or what are the vulnerabilities of systems Y, are, I don't know what that is. So it's very important if this is something you're going to go into, you want to dedicate a lot of time to that. So once you understand the research question, then we start talking about quantifying a boundless world. I've got Abed there explaining sort of tongue in cheek, I'm a dungeon master. I create a boundless world and I bind it by rules. Uh, despite the fact that it's a joke from a sitcom, it's 100% accurate. You have to look at the real world and you have to look at all the complexities it has. You have to look at the research driven analytic questions you've been asked. And then you have to figure out what mechanics are we gonna focus on? What are the core rules that are important here? Everything else is then weighed, whether or not it's more playable or more fidelity. I'm sure everybody on here, a bunch of seasoned war gamers, everyone's at least heard of the uh, nightmare that is Campaign for North Africa, the ultimate high fidelity game and it takes you over a calendar year to play it because it's insane, it replicates everything. Again, we've already covered, our clients don't have that kind of time. So you have to look at what must be played and why. The way I always say this in shorthand is you don't wanna waste time creating a rules module for amphibious invasions in a game about air war, unless 
the amphibious invasion is at the core of one of the research driven questions. And that's the same for everything. You want to make sure you know what you're spending time on. The other thing is there's no harm in saying subsequent games should refocus on areas identified by the first game. It may turn out that, hey, in order to understand this air war and how it might work, we actually really need to know everything about amphibious invasions. That's probably better for an excursion than an initial. You also want to differentiate between rules versus tactics. When dealing with defense professionals, there's a lot of people who say something like, well, we wouldn't do that. That's not a good reason to write a rule prohibiting an action. It's not useful or it's not possible are. One of the reasons I say this is that when you're dealing with defense professionals, it can sometimes be challenging to get them to think outside the box. So if on top of that, you put a bunch of rules in a book that some of them won't read in the first place, and they bar them from doing things simply because, again, we wouldn't do that, that sets a tone for the types of conversations you're going to have during the game. Uh, lastly, and I mentioned this before, it's worth reiterating again, foot stomping. SME involvement, you want to put maximum research effort forward towards SME involvement. The more subject matter experts that you can get a hold of, the easier your game is going to be to design. So once you've got the base rules, it's time for the proving grounds. So development is an incremental process. Most of our folks have a military background and all of us work with the military. So we like the crawl, walk, run. Crawl is proof of concept and basic dev testing. I think this will work. Here's me showing you how these mechanics will work. Walk is advanced test dev testing, stressing margins slash margins testing, and con ops testing. That's once you've built a framework, we wanna to try to run these sorts of things through it. What breaks the game? What makes it not function? Did we calculate these numbers right? Have we made the game unwinnable, too easy, et cetera? And then run is play testing full turns and scenarios. So each segment of testing must be conducted with these questions in mind. Do we have all the mechanics that answer our client's questions? Can the game facilitate a full suite of potential scenarios? And that last one, it's okay to say no, but you need to understand that so that when people ask you, well, can I play X, Y, Z, you can explain this game won't do that, but we can make you a different game or that's better seen through a model, et cetera. And lastly, this one is one that this actually came up at work today. Can the game be easily taught to outsiders with no exposure? So one of the things that differs from our games and just about anything you pick up off the shelf is that not only do we not expect people to play this to be gamers, we expect the opposite. We expect that they are not gamers that this is not their, their home turf. Every once in a while, somebody will come in and their eyes will light up because they realize that they're playing something similar to 40K or Dungeons and Dragons or whatever their, their drug of choice is within the hobby. But much more frequently, we get people that look at tables and tables and tables and their eyes just glaze over and they go, oh my God, I've got to do this for three hours. So the more of that you can remove and make it easier for the end client to understand, or the end user or the client to understand the more likely it is you're going to get your point across and the more likely it is you're going to have a playable game. The way we do that internally is we try to riff people that are outside of our immediate group and rope them in for a few hours and go, hey, can you learn this? Does this make sense? Yes or no. Uh, the other big advantage with that is if you can play with your players before the game date, that's ideal, but that's rare. Again, hard to get people's time. So framing conditions. What goes into all of this? You want order of battle with correct numbers, correct capabilities, correct nationalities. I have seen professional war gamers nearly laughed out of a room for attributing the wrong system to the wrong country or attributing a different model of the wrong system to the wrong country. It's a very cutthroat world about that. Start X conditions and road to war. If you just tell people war is here, uh, everybody with a defense background is going to say, I'm sorry, where's the road to war? Those three words are very important to them. And it's not because they're jerks, it's because their entire frame of reference is how do we get here? Why are we here? Why isn't this reality? Why isn't this what we've been trained for? Why isn't this the scenario we're given, et cetera? So you want to walk them for what happened, where it happened. You're gonna to wanna to talk about what readiness and levels of escalations are. And you're also gonna to wanna to talk about just this, the time of this scenario. Time, scenario time doesn't just mean when it is, it's scenario time in terms of, we're gonna look at three days. We're gonna look at a week we're gonna look at a month and then you break down turns accordingly. And then I have Colonel Mathieu on here. Should France remain in Algeria? If yes, then you must accept all necessary consequences. I don't just have that on there to be cute. Uh, this is what I tell people that if you want me to play with these numbers and these capabilities and these order of battle over this time, this is what you get and you must play the consequences. Sometimes folks get upset with that because they wanna inject new things in and we always say the same thing. You should have put it in the toolkit. So, training day. 
This is something that you look at for you want to differentiate players and visitors. Uh, again, this is something Mitch has experience with. People at the DOD and headquarters level tend to come with a lot of strap hangers. Strap hangers are not useful for your game. They will stand around. They will not make decisions. They will chatter. They will generally be a pain. However, there's nothing you can do to get rid of them because it turns out that if you tell a general, no, sir, you're not allowed to have your staff, he takes that very personally. So you have to do something about them. What we do is we organize into where players go and where visitors go. And visitors are more or less corralled. We try to do a tutorial scenario where we show people, here's how the game plays. Here's how you're going to play with it. And there's two ways to do this. There's a guided tutorial versus a self-tutorial. I will say for my line of work, I have always found it more advantageous to do a guided tutorial. Telling people to do the tutorial themselves usually doesn't work because they usually have, again, competing time requirements. And then on execution day, one of the things you have to look at is updating the engine of the game. No war game survives first contact with the enemy. Every major war game I've been in, there has been at least one thing that players didn't like, which again, considering how we've built these as models, and all models are wrong, some are useful, this isn't surprising. So you have to look at what comes up that is important enough to update either the engine or the game. I will tell you, in, in my experience, this is very rare. Only one or two things. I did have a time playing with a Navy client that we had missed something, or rather misrepresented something so substantial, we had to insert it into the game. But that's rare. We really want people to fight for why is what we have not good enough. Sometimes there's a type of client that just is generally upset or mean or they don't like what's in the game, but they can't really explain it why. Uh, I come off as a jerk, but I, I don't care. I need to know the why. I need to know the so what. If you give me that, I can change it for you. If you don't, we have to move on. Pacing, games move slow. There's a lot of conversation. There's a lot of pause to consult with staff. There's a lot of, you know, oh my God, we have to read all these PowerPoint slides. You have to watch for pacing. Anywhere you can keep that up is better. So data capture. Data capture is one bullet on here, but it is probably the single biggest difference between playing a game for fun and playing a game for analytic purpose. Data capture must be done religiously. You must have as many note takers as possible, notating every single possible move. In a game that involves the equivalent of divisions and cores worth of units, that's a lot of moving parts. But if you don't have it there, the report will be incomplete. Lastly is utility. So there's no, there's no harm in a small game in saying we're not getting what we need out of this game. It's possible that the client demanded a war game when they actually needed a model, or it's possible that they solved the war game very early, or it leads them to an unusual insight and there's no need for a later war game. We have had some versions of that where I work right now, where clients are able to solve the game in a vignette context, and they never need something that's built out that takes up three hours because they cracked it in an hour or an hour and a half. So then you conduct after game analysis, you do additional client demands, you tweak or adjust the game system as it depends, and the third bullet, you plan for the next game. In defense wargaming, there is always a next game. So if nothing else, an analytical war game must, and forgive the karaoke, but I really wanna hammer home these points, resolve or revolve around a research question, provide vectors to answer that research question while taking into effect the most relevant variables, be tested rigorously to ensure both the functionality of the system and the utility of the system, remain playable and teachable to a variety of potential client audiences, and be flexible enough to adjust should new analytic demands, whether evolutionary or revolutionary, present themselves. And then I've got a suggestion for reading, uh, Mark Herman's Wargaming for Leaders. If you've already read it and you didn't like it, I'm sorry, I do. But I can also recommend other books. I know Matt Caffrey spoke yesterday. He's got a book on Wargaming out that is also terrific. Uh, Peter Pearl is the industry classic, but I would warn you that some of his techniques are a bit antiquated at this point. So I would be, be cautious about relying on him. And with that, I've finished promptly at the 30 minute mark and we'll leave the rest of the time for questions. Well, look at that. That's awesome. So right now we don't have any questions. I will uh, allow everybody to unmute themselves. And if you guys have any questions, if not, some of you guys have heard me ask questions for the last few days, so you can prevent that agony um, right now. So let me throw one out for you, Phil. Um, right now in defense wargaming, what is the biggest challenge you see in developing realistic games that actually have a so what factor with them? 
That's a terrific question. I think the biggest challenge to getting impactful games out there is getting client buy-in from people that aren't used to having war games about them. Uh, in defense, war games are very frequently about combat arms guys and door kickers, and they should get war games. I'm not saying we should take them away, but there's a lot of other communities that could really benefit from war games. I think of, again, Air Force Special Operations, Personnel Recovery. Um, there's a lot to be war game there and a lot that could help them decide what they wanted to focus on and what they wanted to spend on if we can get members of their leadership to buy off on war gaming as a useful thought exercise for us. Uh, I think that's probably the biggest challenge, but then the secondary challenge is, as always, the tyranny of time. People want stuff quick, they don't want to wait for it, and they want to put in as little effort as possible to having to learn about it. And when you do that, it's tough to get really impactful games through because you have, to, you have to skip steps of fidelity in order to get it out the door. I think when leaders understand that, they're able to get more out of a game, but if they don't understand that, it's a barrier not just to, to understanding the game, but to any kind of meaningful actions from it. Outstanding, so it looks like we're getting a lot of questions, but Tom Dye raised his hand. He wants to go live, so let him go first. Uh, Tom? Hi, thank you. I am. Um... I was part of the uh, CODA program, African Contingency Operations Training Assistance, made 30 trips to Africa teaching African battalion staffs how to function under the UN auspices of uh, peacekeeping. And uh, we used Janus over there. And um, probably the biggest thing is we, um, even though I sat down with a company commander, I used him as a tool and uh, the real crux of the whole exercise was to test the battalion staff's ability to sift through information. Uh, uh, how long did it take? Was it actionable intelligence? Uh, how long did it take to get a decision made, sent back downstream, the upward and down and lateral uh, communication things are the things that really need to be tested. And like you say, it's dealing with people and uh, TTPs a lot more than uh, weapon systems and such. And that's where, um, that's where uh, military simulations really needs to, to come into play. This is where your generals and your leadership has to apply resources to what he thinks is right based on what information he has at the time. And uh, who can he trust? Unicohesion. How long has this leader been working with his staff and how much can he trust them and all that? So military simulations to me that to be meaningful isn't necessarily first person shooter types, but more along the lines of uh, command and control and communications um, type situations. So uh, that's my background where I came from. I spent six years at AFRICOM in the J7, and I got involved with some successful and unsuccessful uh, exercises in, in Africa, but um, it, it, you learn from it. And if you can repeat the exercises, what you learned from the last iteration can be applied to your current iteration. And uh, if you can only run an ex, uh, a game one time, um, it's, it's almost useless. You need to be able to fine tune it and really make it into a, a, a tool, like you say, the tweaking of it. Now, I'm sorry, that really wasn't a question. Uh, it was more of a comment. And um, I, I pretty much agree with what you put out there. But I think that that's what you put out there is more along the uh, line of what your typical war gamer is going to be looking for. And what I'm talking about is what the war gamer should be looking for, because that's what it's really about. If you're a commander, you're worried about more than tactically placing your troops. You're worried about sustaining the fight. And uh, um, um, that's really the, the name of the game. Anyway, thank you very much for letting me put my two cents worth in and uh, let me mute, mute my mic here. Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, do you want to respond to that or should I hit you with the next question? Because we're getting the questions. Oh. I would like to say thank you. That, that was very insightful. But otherwise, Mitch, you can go ahead and hit me with questions. we got a lot to go through, it looks like. Oh, we do. We do. And we have extra time. We can go after the hour. So we have from Jack, how small can wargaming be scaled and still be useful? 
that's a good question. I think it depends on what you want to get out of it and what other options you have. Um, let's talk like if you scale things down to the battalion level, you can still get a lot of utility out of it at company. You can get some utility out of it by the time you get down to squad and team or, you know, individual fighter craft or whatnot, this really isn't the best choice anymore because you're better off just to go out and do the training. Um, essentially wargaming is great for stuff that's hard to replicate, but if I want my infantry squad of eight Joes plus me as the squad leader to learn fire and maneuver, it's honestly just better to go out to the nearest clearing and teach them battle drill one alpha. So I would say the soft cutoff that I would have would be the first level I think you could apply this using army terms is probably at the company level training up platoon leaders. Uh, platoon, platoons training squads maybe, but I really think for the most part you'd be better off by just having them go out and actually maneuver. All right, let's go on to the next one. And if Jack, if you want to elaborate, just type in the box. This is from Ben Moyer. Can you guide me to useful mechanisms for repairing combat damaged ground systems or mitigating attrition? Oh, this one sounds familiar. Go ahead, sir. <laughs> yeah, that's one we struggle with a lot. Uh, so the, the short answer is it depends on the time and the scale you're looking at. Uh, every main, all maintenance or replacements that I'm aware of are very, very time intensive. So in a lot of games, you can really only play that some stuff is, is repairable. Uh, what I would look at are operational readiness or OR rates. And if possible, talk with the mechanic, try to figure out for the system that you're looking at, how quick does it take to get it go back? What's the parts replacement system like? I think you'll find for a lot of this stuff, it's very, very complex. Um, for an F-15 engine, let's say, if the engine goes out and there's no replacement engine on the base or they've all been used or they were all destroyed by an enemy attack, uh, you're basically doomed. You're not getting it back anytime soon. They may have to go ahead and manufacture one, send you one from the depot. Whatever happens, it will be a long, long time. So I would say you want to look at time. And then once you look at time, you want to talk about what realistic replacement numbers can you get in. Um, I don't think there's necessarily one golden rule for this. Repairing small arms is substantially easier than repairing a fighter jet, which is substantially easier than repairing a nuclear reactor. So some things you have to understand will just be permanently attrited. Now replacements, they're as easy to get as you can flow people in to the contested area, which depending on what you're looking at may be difficult, if not impossible. So you also want to look at replacement rates. How quick can you get in new troops? How quick can wounded troops come back? If you want to get real high fidelity down, you can look at what wounds knock somebody out of a fight permanently versus one week, two week, one month, two month, one year, two year recovery cycle you can get really, really detailed with this. But I think I'm probably going off on a tangent here. So I will slow back down and say that I would usually use percentage of repair, percentage of heal, et cetera. If you wanted to keep track of an individual resource, such as those engines or something else that's a, a very important part of the system that's hard to replace, you might have that, that that affects the percentage, whether or not you have those in stock. Did that answer your question? And Ben, I'm going to piggyback on that. Contact Phil and I um, the first week of October, and we can tell you how well that worked in our futures game coming up because we are putting that in the game. So let me move on to the next one. It's from Evan. How should one go about acquiring the subject matter knowledge on modern air, sea, land, war fighting, war fighting slash capabilities that is so important? So... When I say this, people laugh at me, but I'm dead serious. If you don't want to spend any money and you don't want to go anywhere else, just start with Wikipedia. It's not great. They screw up stuff a lot. Anybody, including people from our adversaries, can hop on there and randomly tear things out or add things into articles that make no sense. But it's a great place to start, at least in terms of learning about what are these systems called, where do they go. Uh, I've found that the best things to learn about are from recognition guide. Again, on the unclass level, Jane's is an excellent resource. They've been in business for, I think, 130 years at this point, doing uh, warship, aircraft, and ground craft recognition. And their stuff is pretty much all universally good. To access their website, you do need a subscription, or you can buy individual books if you're looking at a specific domain. Um, once you get into defense, most of the research for this is going to be done on the high side. I don't want to go into those resources on this line, but if you have a, a need for that and are an eligible person, just send me a note afterwards and I'll direct you there. 
We do call Phil behind his back at work, Encyclopedia Brown, for those of you that remember. Um, we would just like to clone his mind. All right, so this is from iPad, so it could be Peter Perla, but what part of Peter, Peter Perla's book slash techniques are antiquated? You don't. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and punt this one and say if okay. you're really interested, we should talk. We should talk over some drinks sometimes. I have a lot of respect for Peter Perla and what he's done for wargaming, but I a lot of what I've seen is still the same things that was developed in the '80s and '90s, and I don't say that with disrespect. It's just the I don't see a lot of new things coming out from him or CNAS. So that does not mean he's not worth reading. I would specifically say the opposite, but that is my opinion. So uh, Peter, if that's you on the iPad, I, I <laughs> send me a nasty gram. I'll get over it. But that's my opinion. I, I don't know if it is. So uh, here we got one from Tyler. Uh, have you ever applied your skills slash models to a more civilian or defensive scenario? Example, business continuity, public or private? So yes, um, the, the firm I work for actually does a lot of business with banking that needs a, a lot of war gaming for where do they keep money? How much do they have ready? What happens if they get hit by a cyber attack? Things like that. And war gaming really is just gaming. And again, like I showed at the beginning, you can abstract almost anything assuming you have the time. So I think, uh, I think you could apply this to many large scale fields that deal with huge amounts of complexity and theoreticals. Okay, let's go on because the questions are just coming in fast and furious. Uh, we have another one from El, um, Evan and I, I would like to actually to help answer this one. How do you make it easier for the participants to understand, grasp the rules within a minimum effort and time? I'm going to preface this by saying I have sent out how, – how, how big was the Truman booklet? 30 pages? Gosh, the yeah, more, 30, 30 word pages. The more you send out, the more that you could be assured they won't read it and show up to the game and say, tell me how this works. Bill, over to you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so it's really challenging. The short answer is the first person to come up with a good answer for that will win millions, if not billions, of government dollars and contracts because that's what we deal with all the time for what, how complex is too complex and how user-friendly is sacrificing too much of the game. So I don't know if there's one single answer, but I would say the biggest thing that helps is the more people involved that you can get to know ahead of time and understand whether, you know, what kind of learning they prefer and what they listen to and what their gaming background is, the more likely it is you're going to be successful. The best games I've done have had enthusiastic participants that we worked with ahead of time, figured out what would scratch their itch and what would speak to them, and then made the game speak in that language. Fighter pilot's not a fighter pilot. I could teach you to be a, a war gamer in one of our games in 20 minutes. So here we have Michael Ridlon. Uh, it's an easier question. How has war gaming been used to prioritize material acquisition, and what sort of barriers emerge in simulating technologies still in development? i.e. hypersonics. Is okay, this a planted I'll, question? Is this I don't know, but I'll need to be careful about that. I, yeah. I, do, know, um, I do know Mike. Uh, Mike, I think I ran into one of your AC, or AS, AS, uh, uh, air staff guys, uh, the college you went to. May have run into a guy today. But So how has it been used? The, the short answer is, for the longest time, the single largest wargaming capability within the Department of Defense was at an organization called OSD CAPE, which is uh, cost, or cost Analysis Program Evaluation. Um, they have downsized that a little bit, but it used to be that was, you know, a 30 person wargaming cell. That's where Mark Herman got his start on, on the gov. Um, and it was, uh, that whole department is responsible for looking at acquisitions and saying, is this worth it or not? Should we do this? Should we threaten somebody's budget? Should we really ruin somebody's day over this? And that's the most effective it's been used at different levels. I know HQMC uses Wargaming to talk about hypothetical acquisitions, as does Headquarters Air Force. For details on that, uh, Mike, send me an email on the side you know about, and I'll write you more. One of the things Phil mentioned about the uh, strap hangers that come to these games, um, they usually come with an agenda. So we probably could tell you more offline. Uh, Okay, so we, we have a couple of greats. Okay, in wargaming, all domain operations from an army division of core level 
what time frame would you recommend for a player to turn where each player manages air, sea, land, cyber, info, slash space assets? That's a terrific question. Um, the the all domain problem is incredibly complex. Uh, I'm going to ask in return sort of what theater are you looking at and what foe are you looking at? If you're looking at a very geographically com or condensed theater with a very numerous foe, you might have to play four to eight hour turns just because the amount of stuff that's going to happen in that amount of time. But if you're playing a theater where distance and travel matters more and the, the front lines on the ground are somewhat static, you may be able to zoom out and play eight hour turns or even day long turns, depending on what you need to look at. The other thing I would suggest is for, for what time frame you're looking at, I would look at which of these domains is really wearing the, uh, the command hat. Like you said, uh, for division or core level, if it's an army guy leading, and you want to base everything else off the ground timing. If it's an air guy leaning, you want to base everything off the air timing, maritime is maritime, et cetera, and work backwards from there. Now, I got to warn you, that's not going to get you a great answer. Uh, if you've worked with space operators before, they, they tend to work in orbits, and when do I have my stuff available? And when you start telling them you want 24 hours, their eyes kind of go over like, what? Because that's not necessarily the time frame that they inherently think in but you can help get them there by making the rules easier for them to read. That was a good question, actually. Okay, so somebody wants a verification. Um, is it easier to find info on blue systems on Wiki? I don't really know how to answer that without delving into the red. Uh, no comment. Okay, let's see what we have here. We got a lot of thank yous, uh, big plus. Here we go from Jack. When designing it, a war game, do you start from the ground up for designing game mechanics, or do you, I guess, use a pre-built mechanic and plug and play the data points? Good question, Jack. Yeah, terrific question. So I always look at what exists out there. Uh, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. So uh, I'll take a moment to plug one of the games I had up there. Dan Versen Games, Thunderbolt Apache Leader. Great little cast CCA game. Not good for organizations because you have a random mix of Marine, Army, and Air Force stuff, uh, both fixed wing and rotary wing, and I, I can get nitpicky about that. But in terms of how all these systems operate together and functionally what effects do they provide, it's really good. So if I were to make a game that I had to deal with equipping aircraft or equipping helicopters, I would first pull open that game, take a look at how Dan did it, and see what I could modify off of that. Now, if somebody gave me something that I can't find a good example in the commercial world, or the examples in the commercial world are all bad, like they're not enough, they don't get to enough, enough, of, uh, enough of the picture I'm trying to paint, I might have to make something up. But generally, we're a fan that there's enough out there in gaming, and especially when you expand past war gaming and look to broader gaming, uh, we've cribbed useful mechanics from role-playing games, from uh, commercial games about everything ranging from hamburgers to theme parks, uh, a lot of stuff has useful mechanics that allow you to take a real world process and make it gameable. So generally we don't invent brand new stuff unless they've given us something so weird that there is nothing we can do, but invent it. Okay. So we have one from Ben. Um, have you seen 3d print printing used well for game components and defense board games, uh, poker chips. That's the biggie, right? Yeah, so that's actually what I was going to say. Mitch is actually better to, to answer this than, than me. Uh, Mitch, you want to talk about Truman? Uh, Truman's a game that we'll be, Phil and I will be discussing in, uh, with uh, Sebastian and the Georgetown uh, University War Game Society. But, you know, they wanted a map function in the game. And it was really a forcing function to get the two-star and civilian equivalents of all the Five Eyes nations to kind of talk. Um, for some reason, maps bring up a lot of conversation, but we wanted the tactile feel to the game. So we made up special, uh, we ordered special poker chips with uh, our logo on one side. On the other side, we put what they represented on the table. And remember, this was a, a uh, competition game, not conflict. So they represented things like infrastructure building, you know, all the, the facilities of dime. Um, in fact, Robert Domain was there and played the game. So he should give us a thumbs up. But yeah, you know, we've tried using some 3D uh, um, 
printing for the games. Um, you have to remember a lot of our audience, they're not gamers and they just really just kind of want to use the map and see it. We also use a lot of electronic uh, order of battle status keeping, which a lot of people are familiar with because it, it looks like, you know, you're in an AOC or a talk somewhere. So yeah, we don't really use that, which uh, is, leads me to a question I want to ask Phil. So Phil, I know that not only you're a DOD war gamer, but you're an avid hobby war gamer. Um, Absolutely. How many hobby war games have you played and said, this would be something I need to use at work? It probably happens about once a month that I run into something I, I really like. Um, an example I'll give recently is uh, I played a game from, from Tiny Battle Publishing called um, Lion of Malaya, which is uh, about the, the Japanese invasion of Malaya in 1941-1942. And most of the game is, is somewhat old hat, but the mechanic that I really liked was the fatigue mechanic that the, the designer, uh, Eric Congo, uh, or Erigo Villaconga, I believe. I'm probably mangling his name. Sorry, I'm not great at Italian. Um, but he had this unique idea for how fatigue would impact the combat resolution table. And what really impressed me about that was that was also how he did airstrikes. So usually airstrikes that go into games uh, directly attrit an enemy unit or otherwise degrade it. But the, the effect they really got, especially in World War II without precision munitions, is fatigue. It put more strain on, on those units supply. It put strain on the men. They weren't able to sleep. You know, a gun run from a zero may not have killed a bunch of guys, but it, it sure as heck woke them up. So that was a very fascinating mechanic to see and one that I would like to incorporate in, uh, in games we play. And that's just the most recent. I really do think probably about every month I play something from the commercial world that I'm just like, man, that's a really good way to do that. So many good games out there. Oh, so yeah. Evan, Evan says last question, but hey, you can keep asking questions till time's up. Um, what recommendations would you have for someone who plans to try to get a job that is in full or in part defense wargaming. And I'm going to, Evan, if you email me, I'm going to let you listen to a podcast done by one of our speakers last night um, with somebody that is in Sebastian Bay's wargaming club. Actually, she's the president of Georgetown Wargaming. Um, I will get you in touch with her. She probably has a lot of uh, insight because she's also in that uh, position as well. And I'll turn it over to Phil. Yeah, so... Um... There's sort of three things that, that I would do to prep. So the, what you're, really, you're, you're going to make sure you have at least a bachelor's degree. Um, not saying this is right, not saying I support it. I've met at least one talented war gamer who had never gone to college at all. But just the nature of most of these jobs and the nature of what the government requires for it, you're going to need at least a bachelor's degree. If you have a security clearance already, that's helpful. As I mentioned at the beginning, security clearance is a big part of this. Uh, and the more of that you already have done, the easier it is to, to make the transition. Uh, the third thing that I, would, that I would say is figure out what type of wargaming you want to do. So defense wargaming is not a big community. And quite frankly, you can get a lot of places just by knocking on doors and asking, hey, do you need wargamers? So I can speak for a couple of services that I'm familiar with. I know the Marine Corps has wargaming at their war college and at their headquarters. Uh, reaching out to people in the Marines and asking, do you know anybody there? Do you know what they're looking for? Do you know what their stats are? Could lead you to job requirements. The job requirements that are posted aren't always posted for a war gamer. As Mitch can attest, sometimes they're listed as program analysts, as researchers, or uh, any number of other things that they want a war gamer, but they don't know how to advertise for that. Like at Naval Undersea War College, their war gamers are technically scientists. They need a, an advanced degree in, uh, in sciences. So that's what I would say, like learn the paths in, have a clearance or have a path to get a clearance and have a degree. I think if you do those three things, you would be surprised how quickly doors will open. This is really not a big world. And as Mitch can attest, and as you can hear, um, as you can probably hear from, from others, I know this is one of Sebastian Bay's big things. We're always interested in trying to recruit the next generation of war gamers. I'm 32 and I'm one of the youngest guys in this industry. And that is insane to me. And I'm looking for the day I can, I can uh, turn it all over to you. Okay, so here's a fun one. Is there a commercial war game or otherwise that you would recommend for Army Division level or above operations? Hmm. 
You know, I don't even have a really good answer for that one too, because there's either so many or not enough. I think that, so for looking at how a division is going to maneuver on a modern combat zone, I can only give you several imperfect answers. I think the big thing right now that is not played very well are the two newest domains, space and cyber. I will give a soft recommendation for GMT's next war series designed by Mitchell land, which at least has a bunch of things that attempt to uh, confront these problems. It's um, if, if you play next war with all the enhancements and the cyber and, or like the, the cyber module and the full air rules and whatnot, you'll at least get a scope of the complexity of what would it take to maneuver. However, even that I offer with caveats. Uh, to, be, to be blunt, uh, next war with the advanced rules, I would never get my defense clients to play it. There's too much. They wouldn't have time. So Tom, and I'm, Tom, you didn't have to tell me how old you were, but you mentioned a, a great game that everybody tries to find is SPI NATO Commander was Tom's recommendation. I'd have to go with it, but it's been decades since I've seen that game. So it's a hard game to find. Yeah, absolutely. Any more so, questions? Any more questions, Scott? These have been great questions. Oh, we got one from Ben. Um, so Ben asked, do you know of anyone using Python programming language to support the background number crunching for defense war games or modules? Um, yeah, to, you know, not to, to paraphrase the meme, uh, of course I know him, he's me. So it's not literally me, I, I can't program at all, but I have a young guy on my team who is just an absolute wizard at that and we use him to develop a lot of our adjudication tools. So it, we've kind of moved away from the tables of tables of tables and instead moved towards, um, towards that. All right, another one from Tom. Uh, any sims out there that allows for experimental use for drone technology? It's a good one. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not really aware of that. I'm, I'm not as heavy on the, the modeling and sim. Um, anything I am aware of on that is all very high up theoretical. So I, I don't have any good, good recommendations, unfortunately. I do know drones are something that gets discussed a lot, um, whether you're talking about strictly for ISR purposes or combat or any number between they're a big topic of conversation, but they're not, uh, they're not always gamed out very well in part because they fit in so well in modeling and SIM. When you do take the human out of the decision with a drone or reduce the amount of human decisions, the easier it is just to plug that in a direct model and tell you what it's going to do. See what else we have especially anti-drone ideas. So it looks like we are out of questions. That was a lot of questions and you hit it out of the park. So I'll give a, another minute for anybody to throw any last minute questions out there. Phil, once again, I wanna thank you so much for being willing to speak. We did not have to twist his arm. He said right away, I will do it. Thank you so very much for that. Um, this was a great audience. And tomorrow with the professional wargaming series, we had Matt yesterday, we have Phil today, and tomorrow we have Sebastian, which Phil will be moderating. So I wanna thank you, I wanna thank the audience. And um, next up in our round table is uh, Benerson Little, who is uh, author and historian who worked on uh, many titles on the Golden Age of Piracy. He worked on the TV show Black Sails, and he's the historical backbone of uh, Age of Piracy games like Blood and Plunder and Oak and Iron. So I'd like to thank everybody. Hopefully I'll see you guys in the chat. And Phil, thank you so very much for speaking at the roundtable. Hey, cheers. Uh, glad, glad to hear it. I'll stick on Zoom for just a little bit longer if anybody needs to PM me for details on contact.